Okay. Uh, welcome to the Great Lakes Sleep Clinic. If, uh, learning about weather, let me say, is boring. But if you don't learn about weather, then flying in it can get quite exciting. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kerry Kirby. I'm a glider pilot for 35 years, one of the founding members of Great Lakes, and currently the CFI at the club. Um, I started saying that weather is boring, but in fact, I actually love weather and I love predicting it. And tonight, we will cover, just wait here one second, I'll see if we can make the slides go. Where'd that come from? Okay, tonight we will cover the different elements that all go together to make and change the weather. If uh, Let me start by saying I'm thinking that we're going to be rather tight for time. Uh, normally this was like three days to try and cover uh, a, a MET class and uh, we're going to try and do it in less than two hours. So there's, it's going to go on the fly. It might go a little fast. If anybody has questions, if you can put them in the hand pop-up. Uh, questions. Maybe uh, Dave, will I be able to see them at the end, or will you be able to record them? Or what I'll do is I'll I'll let you know if there's any questions and read them out to you. Okay. And then maybe what I do might do is just uh, write them down uh, and answer them later after we're finished. You know, uh, I could put it someplace where where the quizzes are, and and you can go back in a day or so and get your answers there, and I'll give you a proper full answer. Sure, absolutely. And you can always follow up with either of us on email as well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so tonight we will cover the following topics. Um, the atmosphere. Without the atmosphere, the Earth would be like the moon. The, man has, uh, the moon has no atmosphere. And without the insulating blanket effect of the atmosphere, temperatures change. Uh, they range from boiling point during the hot sunshine of the daytime on the moon to dropping to low, below 238, below Fahrenheit at night. And that's all because there is no atmosphere. Uh, clouds. Uh, clouds hold, give, and transport moisture. Uh, we'll cover moisture and temperature. Together they uh, make clouds. Pressure and wind. They move the weather around. Stability and instability. Uh, result in rising moisture, creating clouds and rain. Air masses. Uh, air masses are big weather elephants that hold the weather uh, over large areas. And fronts. Fronts induce pressure changes, wind, rising air, rain, weather mobility. Uh, and then METARS, the reporting language for weather. Uh, basically, it, they try and fit the most information in the fewest amount of characters. Uh, time permitting, we'll finish up by going over how to pick a good uh, gliding day. And, uh, this slide shows the composition of the atmosphere. 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, trace amounts of other things. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why they expect you to know these numbers. Like maybe one day you're going to catch a good thermal and you'll end up stranded on Mars and you need to want to duplicate the Earth's atmosphere to survive or something, but uh, look for it on the exam. For some reason they think that's uh, important to know. Uh, most important comp uh, component of the atmosphere from our perspective is water vapor. Uh, water vapor uh, is the most variable element in the lower atmosphere. Uh, it is important because it is responsible for the formation of clouds, fog, and it absorbs radiant energy from the Earth. And we'll more talk, talk about that more in a few minutes. And here we have the layers of the atmosphere. In the troposphere, the temperature decreases with altitude. Let's see if I can get a 
Nobody report me for pointing this pointer at the airplane. So you see, temperature decreases with altitude. So this is the, you know, the amount that the temperature is decreasing as you go up. That's basically the the, the lapse rate. Um, we'll talk about lapse rate a little bit more too. Um, the tropospause, the temperature. Um, it ceases to cool with height, and it remains a constant temperature of about 56 below Celsius. And it becomes almost completely dry. All the moisture is left in the clouds below. Uh, next to is the stratosphere, where you can see the temperature starts to rise to about zero degrees. And that happens, the stratosphere is about 17 to 50 kilometers kilometers above the surface. Next is the mesosphere, uh, where the temperature again decreases to about, uh, by, sorry, to about 100 below Celsius at about 275,000 feet, 17 to 80 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Uh, after the mesosphere, um, the temperature rises. And that's in the thermosphere. It's not much exciting going there, except pressure drops a little more to two, a little more, bit more than a vacuum. And beyond the exosphere, space. And this slide is just another way of illustrating the layers of the atmosphere, what's in them. Weather balloons, meteors, auroras, shuttles. Um, can anyone tell me the weight of a square inch of atmosphere from the ground up to space? Well, what it weighs at sea level? So to answer that, please type into the question box, and then I'll read back the answers. Oh, thanks. So we're looking at the weight of a square inch of, of atmosphere. From sea level to space. Right, so if we're down at sea level and we had a, a, a column that's a square inch of atmosphere, how much would that weigh? Yep. Okay, a couple answers are coming in. So we got 14 pounds, 14.2 pounds, 29.92 uh, inches of mercury. It's 29.92 inches of mercury of standard atmospheric pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, 14.7 pounds is the answer uh, I got. And if you climbed at 10,000 feet high on a mountain, would the column of air weigh less than at sea level or more than at sea level? I'm getting less, 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 and less, less. Yeah, no, fool. no fools here. Ten pounds. All right, almost got him, eh? Yeah. Okay, most, most weather occurs within the troposphere. Um, it varies in height, as you see here from the deck, it's uh, 28,000 feet at the poles, 54,000 feet at the equator. Uh, we'll go on to cloud types. Um, cloud tops are not considered for heights, but only, uh, sorry, the, the cloud tops, so the, the, the high clouds that we see um, are, the, are the cloud levels, so low clouds, 0 to 6,500 feet, that's to the bases, that's not including the tops, so the bases of, the, of a fractostratos uh, would be, have to be below 6,500, even though the top of it could go, you know, to 10,000 feet. So what they're, what they're classing that by is by the basis of the clouds. So. And uh, clouds of vertical development, these ones down here, they're lumped in with the uh, low-level clouds. And 
if you if you look at the uh, at this uh, if, it, if we go down say high clouds we can find a commonality uh, to all the high clouds and uh, see cirrus cirro stratus cirro cumulus so you know the cirro is the part that's that's labeling it a high cloud uh, this middle clouds we have commonality which is alto alto stratus alto cumulus alto cumulus cumulus castellanus uh, below clouds their commonality is uh, strato so you have a stratus fractal stratus strato cumulus nimbus stratus and vertical commonality is cumulo and then if we look at going down this way down the layered clouds the commonality is stratus yeah all the clouds have stratus if we look at cumulo uh, column the commonality for a cumulo cloud is uh, or a cumuliform cloud is a cumulus cumulo is in all the names of the clouds and the nimbus is nimbus. just another uh, uh, little chart to show you a you know, brief depiction of you know, what what the difference in appearance is between the clouds Stratiform clouds. Um, stratiform clouds form at all three layers of the cloud layers. Stratus uh, are symbolized by the uh, ST. If we go back, you see that each of the, the clouds in that, sorry, in the, in the layers over here, they all have symbols for them. And those would be good to, to know and memorize. Sorry, I'll just go back. So stratiform clouds form all three of the uh, form at all three of the cloud layers. Stratus is low, appears fragmented, thin, can be in layer or sheet, tend to move fairly rapidly uh, within the wind or with the wind. Sorry. Stratocumulus, um, SC. They're low clouds that move faster than cumulus and not as well defined. Uh, uh, they tend to spread out more horizontally uh, than vertically. The cumulus, the bases are normally darker than the tops. Uh, alto stratos, uh, they're middle level clouds uh, that appear as a flat, smooth, dark sheet. In certain conditions, they can indicate that the approach of a cold front trough or a jet stream. They can produce precipitation. If, persip if persistent, then the cloud becomes known as a, a nimbus stratus. Uh, cirrus stratus clouds, like cirrus, they're brilliant white, uh, lack in contrast. Sunlight can pass through them. They can vary in thickness. Uh, they develop in fine weather but can signal the change of weather from a few hours to a few days. Um, for us in, in gliding, if we're doing cross country, it's quite often uh, that you'll fly, if you're flying over 100 kilometers or so, you, you, you could quite easily fly into a band of cirrus that's, that's up above. Uh, even though the sunlight uh, does pass through, it, it, uh, the heat of the sun doesn't seem to pass through. It's, and so if you're going underneath a, uh, a band of cirrus clouds, and they're usually mm, can be maybe range for 20 kilometer uh, 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 influence on the ground. Uh, so you can pass through them, but if you, you, you notice that you're coming up to them, start high um, and conserve your, your uh, sp you know, uh, speed and fly at best LD to try and get through to the other side of them. 
was once last year. I landed out where I didn't quite get to the other side. I was uh, about two kilometers short. Anyway, just a little fact about those. And, and that's assuming, Carrie, I'm guessing that you're not in sync, because of course when we're in sync we want to speed up. That's right. Uh, usually in, in, in the uh, under Cirrus you're finding no lift and, uh, and no sync either. All right, because they're, since they're, they're horizontal, it tends to be a stable error. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Carrie, just a little side note. Um, it sounds like you're brushing against your mic a lot. Sorry. Kind of sounds like you're in a windstorm on this side. That's better. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next deck, uh, cumuliform clouds. Cumuliform clouds also form at three levels, and they include clouds of vertical development. We find lift under cumulus clouds. Uh, low clouds, cum uh, cumulus are cauliflower shaped, dark bases, bright tops at the condensation level. Uh, cumulus that build into towering masses are called towering cumulus or TCUs. Expect to find rough air under, under uh, uh, towering cumulus. Uh, turbulence. Some pretty strong up and pretty strong down. Um, and if you got into them or up the side of them or up uh, close to them, and a little bit, of, if you're flying power, you, you would probably find icy uh, in them. Alta cumulus, um, AC, they look like cumulus mostly, but they're in the middle cloud range about, of about 6,500 to 23,000 feet. They can develop from morning dissipating thunderstorms and redevelop later in the day if the air is still unstable. On days that thunderstorms develop, alta cumulus can make uh, or mask and hide the thunderstorm uh, that's behind it that you can only see through, peek through, through holes in the alta cumulus and you, you might get a glimpse of a thunderstorm that's behind, around, or above. Um, And they can uh, possibly rain, uh, can be associated with alta cumulus and it can be light to moderate, unless of course you run into the one of the thunderstorms hiding behind it. Alta cumulus castellanos, ACTC, uh, they're turreted appearance uh, and instability is the characteristic. Oops, sorry. Um, cirrostratus, CS. They're high clouds, um, more widespread than cirrus. They're brilliant white, again, because they're made up of ice crystals. They lack in contrast. Sunlight passes through them as well. They can develop a few hours to days before the weather change. Uh, so they're, they're, they're a lot like the, the uh, cirrus clouds. Um, and they can be fast moving dependent on the upper winds. Now the nimbus clouds, they bring rain and that's seldom good. It's good for farmers but it's not good for flying. Um, cumulus nimbus, they're heavy masses of cumulus. They extend well above freezing level. Some it awful, often spreads into an anvil shape uh, top and that's a characteristic of a thunderstorm. Nimbus stratus, uh, they're widespread <clears throat> light gray or white sheet cloud. Persistent rain is associated with them. Intensity is light to heavy. Um, maybe more than 15,000 feet thick and they're generally assorted with a warm front. We, as glider pilots, we're generally flying in the low cloud range, uh, not in the clouds themselves, because that's a no-no. But, but that's the band of, of clouds that we fly in. Um, if you are lucky enough to get down to wave, you could be flying in the upper level clouds, but uh, generally 99% of our flying is done in the, in the low level stuff. 
Um, for reference, uh, I've added in uh, the pictures of the clouds onto the deck. I'm not going to go through and read the descriptions. Um, if you check back on the deck or if you, you do your study up, you can look for this diagram which will show you the pictures and depictions of all the, the, the clouds so you can identify them properly. So these are just, like I say, just added for your reference. Yeah, these sort of clouds, this one, these ones here, we're not flying in that. Let's uh, stay home. There's our, uh, and as uh, we were talking earlier when, on Jim's uh, uh, quiz about the uh, definition of, of, of a building cumulus cloud or, or a ragged one, uh, if you look at this one here, it's getting a little raggy around the edges. You see how the sides of the cloud are, are, are uh, you can see fingers coming down. Um, that's usually, and over here, that's usually a sign that, that uh, the cloud is already starting to dissipate now. It's, it's, uh, it's falling apart. So if we were gliding, we would probably tend to pass that one by. It may have a little dark bottom on its spot that's still uh, still slightly active in the middle, but not for long. So. Is is there a good one in that picture? These are the Carrie? real fun ones here. Is there a good one to pick, Carrie, in that picture that we should head towards? Carrie? Hello, Carrie. Not hearing you. Um, I think we might have frozen. If someone can raise their hand, that would be great. Yeah, okay, hands are being raised, so that's good. So I think we might have lost Carrie. Give him a few moments. No, oh, I think we did lose Carrie because his, his, um, microphone icon has disappeared, which is usually a sign that uh, he's disconnected. Hmm. Carrie, are you back with us? Yeah, yeah. We, we lost you from when, that was the last thing you heard. Uh, don't go near that cloud up here because it's got a raggedy bottom and fingers hanging down, and then I asked what's a good cloud to move towards. And there's... Oh, okay. That part, you know, and I thought you disappeared. I gave you a chance to say something, and you didn't say anything. Okay, so a good one, you know, just from from the, the the faint picture that we've got here. That one looks like a better one. Uh, this one again looks ragged. Uh, these are are not really. Uh, that one back there, uh, it shows a little dark bottom on it. Uh, that would be the better one. So you, know, you could you could. You know, if that was the direction you were heading, you know, you could try and bump something off of this one. Try and get a, uh, you know, if you were low, definitely build up something out of here, but ultimately try and get to that one before it goes uh, bad. And then I started to say about this cloud here, if you were if you were a contest pilot on a contest, flying a world contest, and you had to make it around, and, you know, all your points and all your livelihood and all your, uh, you, know, you know, your wife ever talking to you again depended on whether you you uh, won the contest or not, you might touch this and try and gain a little height to get around it and get back into the blue or get out into some area. It's going to go up like hell when you're, you're, you're on the edge of it. Uh, but things that could go bad, you know, there's lightning in it. There's, uh, you know, for all the up, there's just as much down if you get in the wrong spot. So until um, you got a lot of experience and, and, uh, and that just go the other way when you see one. And uh, yeah. Again, stratus clouds doesn't look like a flying day. Let's stay in the clubhouse and drink beer. And the stratocumulus, even though it says cumulus, they're they're not really 
uh, providing any lift either. So. And again, just another depiction of what the levels of the clouds are and, uh, and uh, which ones are where. And measuring clouds. Uh, the cloud amount is defined in as the proportion of the celestial dome which is covered by cloud. The scale used is eights or octaves. Uh, complete cloud, co cloud cover is reported as eight octaves. Half cloud cover is four octaves. And completely clear sky as zero octaves. If there is low-lying mist or fog, the observer will report the sky obscured. And uh, this is how they could show it on a on a report you know, from zero to eight. Okay, we'll move on to moisture and temperature. Um, moisture and temperature. I said in the in the introduction that moisture and temperature give us clouds. Uh, clouds form when the invisible water vapor in the air changes into its visible form, either as water droplets or as ice crystals, snow. Uh, temperature governs the amount of water that vapor, uh, amount of water vapor that a given volume of air can contain. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold. Air is said to be saturated when it contains the maximum amount of water it can hold at a given temperature. The dew point is the temperature to which unsaturated air must be cooled at a constant pressure to become saturated. After the air is saturated, if the temperature continues to fall, invisible water vapor will condense as visible water droplets. This process is called condensation. When the water vapor changes into water droplets and sublimation when it changes into ice crystals. Am I still there? I'm hearing some scratching. Yep, you're still here, Kerry. Am I here? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you fine. Oh, okay. I was getting some crackling. It sounded like going in and uh, the internet, so okay. Um, and sublimation when it changes to crystals. Condem con condemnation, condensation, and sublimation require condensation nuclei, nuclei, or small small particles uh, that the air on which the water vapor can condense when the air is cooled below its dew point. And years ago, when they had droughts in places out in the prairies and that, and they they needed to go and make rain, they would uh, send up some of the local uh, I don't know, crop dusters or whatever, and I think they were full of uh, silver nitrate that they would sprinkle the clouds with to give a nuclei for the, uh, the, the condensation to form around in order to, to hopefully make rain. I'm not sure if they still do that or not, if they ever had any success at it, or whether it was the mayor's brother-in-law that had the Pawnee that uh, found them a good business. But anyway, that, that was the theory. Relative humidity is not when you ask your uncle for a loan and he says, piss on you. Relative humidity is the ratio of the actual water vapor in the air in relation to the amount which the same volume of air would hold if it were 100% saturated at the same atmospheric pressure and temperature. For example, saturated air has 100% humidity. It's like, um, well, remember, 100% saturated from the guy that has four, four sugars in his coffee. That's water and air is much the same, not quite as sweet. 
And this deck shows just what happens uh, when a rising column of air goes up and it reaches the dew point. So it starts off, there's your spread, dew point is 65 degrees, temperature on the ground is 87 degrees, the air starts to rise up. At about 2,000 feet, it's going up at the 5 degrees per Fahrenheit lapse rate, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and the temperature becomes 76, but the dew point is still 65. When the rising air hits 65, the cloud forms. Now, yeah, there's... Uh, a reason why there's some day some days there's a temperature spread and there's just aren't clouds. So some days you have a temperature spread that should allow thermals up to a dew point, but the sky does not form clouds. One reason might be the influence of high pressure areas. Rising air normally expands as it elevates due to the lower pressure, but when a high pressure area is present and the air is slowly sinking, it compresses the air and warms it. No condensation takes place. Another reason for a blue day might be that the air mass is dry and lacks adequate moisture to condensate. Two ingredients needed for clouds to become visible, and that's water and the nuclei. Lapse rate. Now, we talked about this a couple times, so here it is. The lower atmosphere is heated by radiation. I think 47%, I think, of the sun's energy goes into the ground and bounces, comes off as heat, um, reflect, reflected back to the atmosphere of the, of the sun's heat that is absorbed by the earth. In other words, we are heated from below, not from above. I think 7% might be heated from above. Uh, Oh, lines joining places of equal temperature on a met map are called isotherms. Just point to know. Uh, and because we are heated from below, as you go higher, the temperature gets lower. The lapse rate is the rate of decrease in temperature with height. There are two types of lapse rate the environmental lapse rate, and this refers to the actual change of temperature with altitude for the stationary atmosphere, i.e. the temperature gradient, and the, and the actual, the environmental lapse rate is something that uh, they, would, they would determine by a radio sound or, or you could send the tow plane up with a thermometer and you could measure the temperature at a thousand feet. 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet, you know, 2,500 feet, and measure it every so often up, and you get the drop in temperatures, uh, how it's happening, and that's called the environmental lapse rate. What the air, the parcel that you're currently in is actually doing. You know. And then we have the adiabatic lapse rate, uh, which refers to the change in temperature of a parcel of air as it moves upwards or downwards without exchanging heat with its surroundings. Uh, there are two adiabatic lapse rates, the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the moist or saturated adiabatic lapse rate. I'll show you that next. Oh, sorry. Did you, uh, uh, so this kind of bounces with we, the... We, we, uh, it used to be everything in feet, now we're in, in Celsius, so a lot of places you'll look, you'll get um, soundings from U.S. sites, NOAA and whatnot, and uh, you'll, you'll have to be a little bit uh, conversant if you want to use it in, in, uh, in, in Fahrenheit figures or convert them. Um, but here, the saturated adiabatic lapse rate is 1.5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. So what it's saying, and the dry adiabatic lapse rate is three degrees Celsius per thousand feet. So the dry adiabatic lapse rate 
is when the air, parcel of air rising from the ground goes up, it follows the dry adiabatic lapse rate. And that's three degrees for every thousand feet. Uh, the air will cool. Once it hits the condensation level, it turns into the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, and it cools at the one and a half degrees per thousand feet. Per, yeah, one and a half degrees Celsius per thousand feet. So the reason for that is why the two different rates. Here it is in Fahrenheit, so five degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. If it doesn't condensate, and make a cloud or hit the hit the dew point level. Um, so the dry adiabatic lapse rate is five degrees, three degrees Celsius per thousand feet. This is from the ground to the saturation level, the dew point. From that point upwards, it becomes the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, three degrees Fahrenheit or 1.6 degrees Celsius per thousand feet. Um, and what happens when it hits this, the, the um, saturated uh, rate is that if clouds form, um, latent heat is given off, and latent heat will, will um, heat the parcel a bit and cause it not to rise quite as fast. And hence the two different levels. So you can determine uh, the height of the cloud base of convection or where the clouds are going to be, the cumulus, uh, by knowing the dry adiabatic lapse rate, the dew point, and the temperature at the field. Uh, our quick rule of thumb: if you do, if you don't get a weather report to tell you how high the clouds are, you can figure it out pretty pretty uh, by, pretty close by guessing at it, and or not guessing by by working it. Take the difference between the temperature and the dew point, divide it by the dry adiabatic lapse rate. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is three degrees Celsius per thousand, and the result is the height of the cloud base in thousands of feet. Sorry, I had to wet my whistle. So in the example, <clears throat> the airfield is 1,500 feet. The elevation, the surface temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. Dew point is 9 degrees Celsius. Cloud base. So the spread in the temperature between the 21 degrees Celsius and the 9 degrees Celsius at, at dew point, uh, the surface temperature and the dew point spread is 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, the spread divided by the lap, lapse rate, which is 12 degrees spread divided by 3 degrees lap rate, equals 4. Cloud base is going to be approximately 4,000 feet above ground or 5,500 uh, 5, feet above sea level. And it works maybe 70% of the time. But then again, it doesn't, didn't tell you if it was going to be a blue day, if there wouldn't be any clouds. It just told you if there was clouds, what height you could expect them. If it was a blue day, you might expect lift to go that high. Uh, icing in clouds, for your reference. Anything uh, below freezing level, um, no icing threat. If you're up into the supercooled liquid in you know, to, to 15 below, uh, significant icing. If you're flying uh, in the mixed phase where some, you'll, you'll get some icing and that's from 15 below to 40 below and above 40 below level, get no icing. I like my cake without icing anyway. Standard atmosphere at sea level, 
which was we heard earlier tonight, at 15 degrees Celsius and relative density of 1. Um, low pressure areas, cyclones. They generally move from the west to east at five to 700 miles a day. Um, that's usually a pretty good rule. Um, if you want to see what, uh, if there's a low pressure out over you know, uh, Chicago uh, or just the other side of Chicago today, it, it'll probably be over us tomorrow. They don't always have to move. Sometimes they can get stalled. Uh, there's different things that can stall them. Uh, you can get a mega block from from the jet stream that can form and keep a low pressure in in place for. Well, I've seen low pressure sit in, in one spot for ten days. That's usually if there's a gliding contest that's ten days long, the low pressure can sit right over top of it for ten days. But um, but I don't think they've actually determined that it's a gliding contest causes low pressures, but it's pretty close. Uh, they can be as large as half a continent or as small as a tornado. Winds that flow anti uh, winds flow anticlockwise in in towards the center of the low. Um, high pressure areas, fine fair weather, clear skies, light cool breezes. Uh, winds generally light and variable, circulating clockwise out from the high towards the low. Move more slowly than lows and can remain stationary for days. And, it's usually what we look for is good soaring weather. And density altitude, because you need to uh, know it on probably on the test, this measure of air density is not to be used as a height reference, but determining the criteria and performance capability of an aircraft. Air density decreases with altitude. As air density decreases, density altitude increases, and further effects of high temperature and high humidity are cumulative, resulting in an increased high density altitude condition. We're getting to the point here of what this means. Effects on density altitude. High density altitude altitudes reduces the all aircraft performance parameters. To the pilot, this means that the normal horsepower output is reduced, propeller efficiency is reduced, and a higher true airspeed is required to sustain the aircraft. It means an increase in runway length, uh, requirements for takeoff and landings, and decrease in climb rate. For example, an aircraft requiring 1,000 feet for takeoff at sea level under standard atmospheric conditions requires takeoff of approximately 2,000 feet at an, at an operational altitude of 5,000 feet. So. Why does that mean anything to us in gliding? We don't have a propeller. Uh, it means the biggest time we're going to see it and the biggest time we should be aware of it is when we're going to get towed off the field. Uh, if we have a hot, hazy day, extremely hot, extremely humid, um, and we're operating off of a short runway that you know is marginal at the best of cool days in the winter. Chances are you're not going to make it off on a on a on a uh, hot, humid day because the density altitude has decreased the performance of the tow plane. Um, so something to be careful uh, of. We uh, at Great Lakes uh, look for it on the on those days. So. And this will also affect our landing performance as well, right? Because we'll have a longer landing roll and we'll be touching down at a higher ground speed. That's correct. You'll, uh, you'll, your landing roll will be longer. And uh, um, all right. something else I was going to say escaped me. Anyway. Um, oh, and if you, yeah. I remember what it was. That going back to, to the density altitude. Uh, if you if you if you're you know at a hot uh, hot humid uh, conditions and you're at a at a flying at a club that uh, happens to be higher elevation, that's just going to compound it even worse. And uh, you know your your uh, you know, 
you may be flying equivalent to if the plane was taking off at 7,000 feet, you know, which is you know, like we all know that when we're towing up to 4,000 feet uh, for, for spin checks and that, the tow plane starts to lose you know, performance. It takes longer and longer once you get over 3,000 feet. The, the, you know, the, the performance of the tow plane isn't there. It's not pulling you up. You're sitting there you're reading a book waiting to get to 4,000 feet because it's taking so long. So, and that's the same sort of thing on a, on a hot, hazy day. By Bellet's Law. This is the one you'll remember the rest of your life as well. If you stand with your back to the wind, the low pressure will be on your left side. Uh, the reverse is true in the southern hemisphere. So it'll be on your right side. So if you pretend you're standing out there and the wind's blowing at your back, you put your left hand out, you're pointing at the uh, at, at the center of the low pressure. Um, I always wondered, and I think it's right, I can't see why it's not, would not be right, that if you stuck your right hand out, you'd be pointing at a high pressure. But I, uh, don't quote me on it. Uh, pressure and wind. So, I think they taught us this in grade six or seven. So we all remember that, right? Um, the next slide might put it a little bit more. Uh, you know, this is the descriptive tells you the the, the latitudes, um, where the prevailing winds are. Let's go to the next one. Prevailing winds in the north and south hemispheres they become a mirror image at the equator. So uh, what you see on the yeah, on the north side of the equator is mirror imaged on the south side of the equator. There's a so we have the polar front, the horse latitudes, intertropical convergent zone, trade winds, the westerlies. Polar Easterlies, global wind patterns are named by the direction from which they blow. The globe is encircled by six major wind belts, three in each hemisphere. From pole to equator, they are polar easterlies, the westerlies, the trade winds. All six belts move north in the north summer and south in the north winter. And never the twain shall meet. Ah, now finally something more interesting. <laughs> Land and sea breezes. Um, at Great Lakes we have many the opportunity to fly to most of our Great Lakes. Uh, sea breezes are something I've been interested in for a few years now. Uh, I've flown along sea breezes on Lake Erie. Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Simcoe, and uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure, maybe just Georgian Bay. Uh, last year I caught the edge of one. Um, some great flights have already happened here, uh, the eastern edge of Huron. Um, Two years ago, um, I had a great flight down Lake Ontario, uh, pretty much from Oshawa to uh, to the end of Lake Ontario, and then ended up landing in. When I ran out of lake, I landed at Brockville, but uh, it was a great flight, one of uh, a memorable flight. Um, and what makes it so? We got warm air uh, over the land, rises. Um, Cool air over the water comes in to take the place of the warm air rising and heats 
rises as well. Um, cumul cumulus form will often move seaward uh, to take the place of the cool air that's coming in. Uh, the upper level returns the, uh, the land breezes out and the cool air aloft sinks over the water, sea breezes, mess cold front. So it forms like a little front here. So it's, um, it then develops all along down the, the uh, uh, shore. Um, the clouds are kind of funny. The, if you're coming from other clouds that may be over here on the land, they may be 1,000, 2,000 feet higher than the ones that are along the sea breeze. Uh, and you think, oh, everything's dissipating or everything's, uh, you know, the clouds are getting lower. But that's just a sign of, of the sea breeze. So, uh, you know, you may have been in three knots lift over here and these lower clouds are just banging up at, at uh, five knots lift. Uh, not quite going as high, but they're more constant and they're more, uh, they can be just one after the other that they're all joined together so that uh, when we went down the, the uh, shore of Lake Ontario, we spent minimal time circling. Everything was just running this, this uh, line of clouds that went down the lakefront. And uh, the other odd characteristic of them is that they can have like little fingers coming down, uh, which when you're used to, you know, as I said before in the cumulus clouds, when you see them raggedy on the edges, um, it's a sign that they're dissipating. Um, when you see a, a sea breeze that has, you know, if you're close to the water and you see these fingers coming down, that's a good thing. Um, it seems to be um, just a moisture mass of air that is forming cloud 500 feet lower and uh, uh, on the on this on the sea side of it, and uh, I've experienced a, a few years back in Lake Huron on one where there was just this little wisp started, and then I started circling in it, and uh, I guess I was stirring up the air that this uh, little wispy cloud was forming itself around the outside of me, and it was I just felt like I was being enveloped by a candy ca uh, a cotton candy machine that was swirling around the outside of my glider as I was circling uh, so tight, but it was only as wide as the wingspan of the glider, but it was just enveloping me like in a cocoon. It was uh, so weird. Anyway, so sea breeze, and you can also uh, inversely get the land breeze. Uh, the land breeze might be good if you want to soar over the water at night. Um, uh, land breeze I learned about not gliding, but uh, when I was a scout leader, um, I had a shop that was right on in Oshawa on the uh, shore of the lake, and um, we were uh, as a scout leader we were going camping in the following week, and I needed to I volunteered to waterproof the the, the scout tents, so I. It was somebody got me a gallon of uh, silicone uh, waterproofing, and it was a spray. And I put it in my spray gun, and I uh, opened the overhead door that was facing the lake. I hung the tent on the bottom of the overhead door, so it was half outside, half inside my shop. And, and I looked at the wind. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon. People, had, you know, my employees had gone, so I thought, well, okay. I'm, on my own now, and the wind's blowing out, so I don't need a mask or anything. I can just, you know, sp spray out the door, and all this stuff is going out the door. And I think I had five tents to do, and uh, and I just kept spraying and spraying and hanging another tent, spraying, 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 hanging another tent. And uh, when I just finished the last one, it was maybe about seven or eight o'clock at night. And uh, and when I tend to work, I I engross myself in things, and I don't look around. And uh, anyway. I'll, this is what I did. I, I finished the last tent. I stopped spraying. I turned around. I looked behind me, and my shop was totally a white cloud. The uh, land breeze from the lake that I was at that night had the sea breeze had turned to a land breeze. The wind had changed direction, and uh, it blew all the silicone right back past me. Uh, I ended up in the hospital that night with silicone lungs because I didn't have a mask because I thought I was uh, spraying out to a, 
to a sea breeze. So. Be careful. Sea breezes can be dangerous. <laughs> so basically what we learn here is don't spray silicone and carry shop at night. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Carrie, we are at 8.15, which is just a little bit past the halfway mark, and this seems like a pretty good spot to stop for our break. Okay. So I'm just going to unmute everyone for a moment, and Arthur, you're showing up three times, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but uh, I'm just going to unmute everyone and just do a quick touch base. Does anyone have any questions? So everyone's unmuted except Dane. Any questions so far? Hi. I, I got a question for, for the clouds and the clouds uh, development. Uh, what stops the clouds from vertical development? When, uh, how long can they go vertically? And, uh, and does the vertical development of a cloud uh, uh, how does this affect on the strength of uh, of the lift under that cloud? If you assume that is a cloud that have any lift. Okay. So what stops a cloud from further vertical uh, ascending higher is uh, when the the uh, temperature of the rising parcel of air matches the temperature of the air around it. Uh, Hot air rises, and if it's as hot as the air around it, it won't rise anymore. Or if it's as cool as the air around it, um, it won't rise anymore. So it's you know, uh, so that stops the ascension. So uh, and so this rising uh, parcel of air cools as it goes up. When it when it cools to the point where it matches the the, the surrounding air, it stops rising. Um, the cloud. Um, also, though, gives off latent heat. So when when condensation happens, uh, heat heat is a byproduct byproduct of condensation. So when a cloud uh, condensates, turns into a or when a rising parcel of air condensates, turns into a rising cloud, it gives off heat. If that heat will go at, will be added to the parcel and and uh, allow it to then become warmer and start rising again. So, um, and the heat, the latent heat will will come down. It can be felt below the cloud. So sometimes you could be, you know, thermaling up at uh, three knots of lift, and as you get to within four or five hundred feet of the bottom of the cloud, uh, and that's as high as you're legally to, to go. Uh, but you feel that the lift. Uh, all of a sudden increases, the, the, the strength of the thermal increases uh, and it can increase to five uh, knots uh, of lift and that I think is from the latent heat of the condensation process, uh, the heat that's given off in the condensation, um, boosting the thermal and um, so I think that might answer it. That that's answer for you? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that sounds like an answer. I'm yes. just sorry, sorry for delaying everyone from the break. I, I'm just curious because in, in the normal nice flying day, you fly along those nice cumuluses. They work well for you, and yet in not so far distance, you get you observe that uh, cumulonimbus, like the CB forming, which is very very high. Like it can go up to 11 kilometers, I think. I don't yeah. know that indeed. Uh, I, and that can be I, I, that can be a series of many cumulus coming together, uh, and all the latent heat coming together, and then just causing the parcel to superheat and uh, just going vertical, going you know, and and the air being unstable as well. Um, and stability has as as some play in it. Uh, if there's a stable air mass above, you know the the. Uh, the clouds could go up until they hit the stable part of the air mass. The clouds can go up until they hit an inversion. That will cap off any uh, lift. So sometimes we can go up uh, to 4,000 feet and not get any higher. Uh, there may not be any uh, clouds, and that's an inversion. That, uh, and an inversion is a warm area of um, warm layer of air 
that's uh, at a certain level. Okay. So, so the uh, so you may have an immersion at 4,000 feet. So what happens is the warm air goes up, and it would need to get to 5,000 feet to form a cloud, but it can't get past the the inversion at 4,000 feet because the you know if it's uh, if the inversion layer is 20 degrees and the rising air is 20 degrees, well it won't. It has got no power to get up through the inversion. It'll, it'll kind of cap it off. Yep. Cool. All right. So let's uh, let's take our break here. Again, I'll put the timer up as I usually do. Um, Carrie, I'm just going to take uh, control back uh, just so that I can have my timer show. And uh, we'll see everyone back here in about 10 minutes. Okay. See you in 10.
Okay, we're in the final countdown. Five seconds to go. I'm just going to start unmuting everyone. Welcome back, welcome back. Making a lot of noise with their, their microphone. Sorry. That's all right. There we go. Okay. So, I figured it was appropriate if we had clouds, ro clouds rolling by on our uh, on our break here. So, just uh, while we get restarted, was there any thoughts, questions, comments before we turn it back over to Carrie? Oh, my goodness. Karen? Well, Mom, I didn't know they did have any fun. The nation keeps having itself. Okay, I think we'll mute Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so, gathering from what I've learned so far, this is my first shot of meteorology stuff like that. Is it our best chances to find lift late in a day? Late in the day? No. No. Your best chance is the is, is two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. Or okay. Between one and three, say. That's your best time of the day. Okay. Okay, so and the systems as the, it's sun angle and as the sun hits the ground and the you know, as the sun's more of an angle it's not hitting direct to the ground, so it's uh heats up less. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, yeah makes sense. So, Carrie, I've handed it back over to you, so if you can share your screen again, would be great. And while you're just doing that, I'm just going to, there we go, we can see you again. I'm just going to mute everyone, and I'll unmute Carrie, and uh, we've got about a half an hour to go. Um, so, Carrie, back over to you. Okay, I'll see if I can hustle up. Um, okay, so this picture here is actually me going down uh, the coast of Lake Ontario. Port Hope is on my right, uh, Lake Ontario on my right, uh, Kingston's in the distance, and it was uh, Trenton's up ahead someplace, so we went right over Trenton Air Force Base, just kept going. You see that uh, it, it was a, kind of a funny day. It was, uh, it was very surreal that the uh, you can see there weren't a lot of clouds just right over my head, but there was always clouds appearing. I was always thinking that, the, well, the flight's over because there's no clouds ahead. And then just as soon as I'd say that, oh, there's some clouds appearing. And I'd hit those, and I'd look ahead, and I'd say, well, there's no clouds ahead. That's it. And then more would pop up. And, it was, uh, and then you'd look behind you, and the ones that you had just used were gone, and there was no clouds behind. So it was as if somebody was putting these little popcorn kernels right exactly where we needed them all, all the way along so till the end anyway um, last point on uh, on sea breezes they can go um, uh, winds can blow on inland 13 to 19 kilometers an hour uh, and then uh, later in the day they'll go parallel with the shore um, and the effect can go uh, um, Inward penetration of sea breeze can reach 15 to 50 kilometers uh, inland. And next we move on to, try and find my pointer, there we go. Uh, Katie Batic antibiotic winds, um, probably on the exam. Uh, Catabatic wind originates from traditional cooling of the air atop of a plateau, uh, a mountain, a glacier, or even a hill. Uh, since the density of the air is inversely proportional to the temperature, the air will flow downwards, warming adiabatically as it descends. The temperature of the wind depends on the temperature in the source region and the amount of descent. So at night, the mountain cools down, the air becomes heavier, so it descends. In the afternoon, the sun warms the slope of the ridges, uh, warms the air, the air is lighter, it ascends. So you have a wind going up the hills. Anabatic wind is a valley wind. Catabatic wind is a mountain wind. Wind gradient. Wind gradient. 
um, wind speed progressively decreases close to the ground due to the surface friction. So trees, mountains, rocks, things that drag, uh, you know, that the wind is, is brushing against is slowing it down. Um, and the stronger the wind, the more prominent it is. Um, the effect of flying, flying through a wind gradient is a sudden decrease in speed. Um, it's not nice getting caught in a wind gradient. If you imagine you're flying along at 45 knots and all of a sudden you're flying into a wind gradient and now you're flying at 25 knots. Don't think you're, in most planes you're not calling that flying. Uh, you're calling that diving to the ground in a stall or a spin. And uh, so, um, and it's um, something you can't see. So you know, the best you can see that you've got wind, and you can you can say, well, you know, I've got wind, and I've got some trees and turbulent things up ahead. So maybe wind and turbulent tree or trees might make gradient. So you know, if you think there's any chance of of a, of a gradient, add more speed. You know, just put more on. An extra five knots for granny. Uh, in this uh, deck here, it says uh, VAP 1.3. I think that's 1.5 now. Is it? Uh, are we changed now? I believe, Dave. Yeah, the the flight training and safety officially changed it to 1.5 this year. So. Yeah. Okay. So. And Coriolis effect. Let's try this. We can't hear the video, Carrie, so you'll have to narrate for us. Oh, really? Oh. What they're talking about. Oh, hang on one second. That's almost working. You can turn your volume up a little bit higher. No, Carrie, not hearing it. Okay. <laughs> so what they're saying is they're going to throw this paper airplane, and you would normally expect the paper airplane to go straight in the direction that you that you, that you uh, threw it, but because the Earth is spinning around, when you, when when you throw the paper airplane. The spinning momentum of the Earth is going to do this, as shown. Yeah. And that's due to the Coriolis effect. So basically, the, the Earth is spinning around underneath the straight wind, so over the ground, the wind yeah. tracks on a curve. That's right. Same thing, same thing as what's happening to the paper airplane there. So, and now they're just talking about the hurricane spinning and there being a low pressure. And there'll be a little, uh, uh, even though you can't hear it, you know, there'll be a nice little graphic here showing what happens around a high pressure. And, uh, yeah, the graphic is. So this is what, it's, instead of it going right to the center, uh, it's being deflected from the Coriolis effect, so it's slight, slightly to the right, and it keeps trying to w make its way to the middle, but it keeps getting deflected, causing the whole thing to spin, sort of like a pinwheel. And this is in the southern hemisphere, it flows in the opposite direction, and storms in a low pressure will spin around in a counterclockwise, or clockwise manner. Oh, so. 
You couldn't hear that, eh? It, it's a limitation of the uh, webinar software that we have. Um, but what you can do is on the um, the handout for the quiz, let's include yep. the, the HTML, let's include the link and people can watch it. Yep, sure, sure. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other points that I've got here that they didn't cover, even though you couldn't hear them. Making myself sick looking at this laser pointer. Um, okay, uh, stability and instability. Anybody else? Uh, air that resists upwards and downwards displacement and return to its original height is said to be stable. Uh, step then that's uh, you know stable air stops uh, vertical development so stable air is smooth associated with stratiform clouds steady precipitation poor visibility uh, air that tends to continue into the direction of the displacement is said to be unstable uh, unstable air is is better for gliding than stable air um, associated with clouds vertical development showers thunderstorms good visibility Principal North American air masses. This shows the types of air masses. We care about air masses because they affect our weather and the ability to forecast weather. An air mass is a large section of the troposphere with horizontal uniform properties of temperature and moisture. Uh, the troposphere is made up of air masses. The original properties of an air mass are based on the surface over which it is formed known as the source region, so continental Arctic uh, formed over the Arctic, um, a polar formed over the poles, maritime formed over, uh, maritime Arctic formed uh, over the Arctic, maritime polar formed over the polars, uh, poles, and maritime tropical formed over the tropical. And properties. Um, cold air masses, instability, turbulence, good visibility, cumulus form, clouds, showers, hail, thunderstorms. Cold air masses, so um, instability, turbulence, good visibility, cumulus form, clouds, all those things on that list, barring the shower, hail, thunderstorms, are what we tend to look for in gliding. Um, if we're insured well, the shower, hail, thunderstorms. Um, warm air masses, stability, smooth air, poor visibility, stratiform clouds, fog, drizzle, none of those things are what we look for in gliding. So um, there's, a, there's a good point. Um, chart shows you the summary it's for your reference. Um, study on it before you uh, go for the exam and maybe one more question you get right. Um, fronts. Remember that the troposphere is made up of air masses. A front is the transition zone between two air masses as it appears on the surface of the earth. Above the surface of the earth potentially for a considerable upward height the frontal surface is the surface of contact between two contrasting air masses that come together. Um, air masses come from either polar regions or tropical regions. It is that interaction of the air masses that is responsible for weather changes. The polar front is a primary frontal zone in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it is the transition zone between the cold polar air and the warm tropical air. Different types of fronts, warm fronts, cold fronts, stationary fronts, occluded fronts. Cold front results in the cold air that is advancing and it's blue on a weather map. 
a warm front results. If the cold air retreats, and it is red on a weather map. A stationary front results if the two air masses are stationary. An occluded front is hard to describe, but hmm, I changed the deck and I did describe it. Okay, I'll describe it. Um, an occluded front is where you have a cold, the fast edge of a cold front overtaking the slow edge of another cold front, the, the, the trailing edge. So the trailing edge of a cold front is moving slower than the front leading edge of the cold front. So if you have the leading edge of one overtaking the uh, trailing edge of another and there is a warm air mass in between and the warm air mass rises and is lifted off the ground, then that is becomes an occluded front. Um, I'll talk about each of these in more detail, and or not. I have another slide deck, uh, or another video deck that we might not hear, but it's uh, the graphics on it might be self-explanatory. So let's uh, let's let's give it a try and see uh, if it makes the point here. We getting any sound on that one, Dave? Nope. So probably if you just describe this, this is a cold front coming in, and you know how it's pushing the warmer, uh, moist air up, creating the, that line of clouds and showers. But you notice the cold air coming in from behind is is relatively clear. And that's kind of what we tend to see with a cold front, and. Um, Cold fronts tend to be faster moving than warm fronts, if I remember correctly. Carrie? Nope. Oh, I think we might have lost him. Let me just do a quick check here. No, he's still there. Um, yeah, so we get that, that, that cool, clear air coming in behind, and that's where the warm front, uh, the warm air has that, that um, you know, cloudy rainy type stuff. Now the good thing with the cold front is it tends to it tends to pass fairly quickly. Um, so once that line of showers is passed then we get that cooler air coming in that's typically clearer. Do you want to move on to the next one Carrie? Because I think the next one shows the warm front. Oh sorry. That's okay. I had my ear, earphones off. You were uh, <laughs> not a good ear. I was I was narrating the cold front for you. Then oh, cold, yeah. cold fronts Thank move you. in faster than warm fronts, right? Like they they tend to be faster moving. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So let's okay. Have a look at the so. Oh. Nope. Yep. No, that that's uh, the warm front, the cold front, and the occluded front are all in that uh, in that uh, slideshow. So if we can put that in for people to go through when they. It's, it's very good and very explanatory with the graphics and everything. To, so we'll, to, we'll add it the as the URL to the yep. thing. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, winds. Uh, the we so some of the descriptions we've, I've still got. Um, the weather resulting from a cold air mass advancing on a warm air mass will depend on the moisture content of the warm air mass the stability of the warm air mass, and the speed of the cold front. For example, if the cold front air is pushing or unstable warm air, uh, sorry, pushing up unstable warm air, cumuliform clouds will form. If the warm air is stable instead of the cumuliform cloud, the cold front will result in stratiform cloud. A particularly fast moving cold front advancing on an unstable warm air mass can cause a squall line. Uh, which is a line of thunderstorms 
accompanied by sudden and often violent wind change. Um, Squall lines are, again, something even a lot of experienced pilots will avoid. They're fun to ride, but uh, they, can, they can move, they can trap you into landing in some spot that you don't want to land. Um, you don't want to uh, fly under a squall line. There is thunder and lightning and uh, turbulent air. Very high, uh, uh, very very uh, strong lift up, very strong down uh, drafts. Um, it's uh, even a narrow one of a mile is uh, and being 3,700 feet, you will be on the ground within three minutes, uh, or could be on the ground. I was on the ground in three minutes from 3,700 feet. Uh, trying to fly through one once. Uh, I had finally glad to get to where I was going and it rapidly disappeared as soon as I got the other side of the squall line and, uh, and I ended up in a bean field. So, and that was just one I uh, chalked up to. Well, I don't think I'll do that again. So. And um, what else we got next? The weather resulting from warm air mass advancing and retreating on a cold air mass will depend on the moisture content of the warm air mass, same as the cold front, the stability of the warm air mass, same as the cold front, and the degree at which it overruns the cold air mass. For example, if the warm air mass is very moist, clouds may extend for hundreds of miles up the slope of the retreating cold air, uh, that is, in advance of the warm front. If the warm air is unstable, uh, there may be thunderstorms. Gain, uh, slide deck is self-explanatory. Um, stationary front occurs when there is little or no movement between the air masses. That's uh, all I have to say on that. Thunderstorms. Um, regardless of the type, they go through three stages. The developing stage, the mature stage, and the dissipation stage. Depending on the conditions present in the atmosphere, uh, these three stages take an average of about 30 minutes to go through. Again, as far as flying in Thunderstorms, they do it in England, um, they do it in some parts of Europe, uh, they do it on instruments, it's forbidden in North America, and uh, they drink warm beer in England. So, um, We talked about latent heat. Um, I think I gave that in, a, in an explanation, explanation earlier when we were talking about what stops and what, what makes clouds go up. So covered that, I think. Uh, average thunderstorm, 24 kilometers in diameter. It's, uh, if you're thinking on getting through to the other side of one, you know, if it's a, if it's a cell, you know, with all the down that happens from the rain, uh, you're not getting 24 kilometers even in a you know, in a fancy glider. So don't go there. Uh, four main types of thunderstorms: single cell, multi-cell, squall line, and also called a multi-cell multi line, and a supercell. I don't think any of them are worth flying in. Supercell is the strongest thunderstorm, most commonly associated with hail, high winds, tornado formation. Uh, thunderstorms, when you're flying and you see a thunderstorm, it's not hard to avoid it. Uh, you can fly the other direction um, and get away from it. Uh, lightning happens for quite a ways, though. Out of a, a thunderstorm, I forget the figure, 20 miles, something like that. Lightning can happen 
away away from a thunderstorm. Um, one time flying in a contest in Ottawa near uh, thunderstorms. I was flying with a, uh, another pilot beside me, and uh, we were commenting on whether there was possible thunderstorm. And all of a sudden, my uh, I think I had my hat off for for some reason, but my hair was standing up, uh, being sucked up to the top of the canopy. At which point, I decided I was too close to. If, I was pretty sure there was a thunderstorm, and I was too close, and my hair was standing up, and I was getting the hell out of there. So. Um, dust devils. Just uh, thought I'd touch on this one. I saw one of these up in uh, Great Lakes one time, uh, probably about 10 years ago or more, and uh, it was the weirdest thing for southern Ontario. I've seen them you know, in southern states and that, but and they tend to move around kind of like the old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon with the, the, the Yosemite Sam, or the, 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 the well, maybe there's a roadrunner had the, the, the moving dust devils in them, but the, uh, the uh, one at, uh, it was over Alliston, and I saw it from about 15, 20 kilometers away, and I thought, what is that thing going up? And it was going up to about 4,000 feet, and uh, and it piqued my curiosity, and I, I flew back towards it, and I was about 10 miles away or 15 miles away. and So it took me a few minutes to get back there, and uh, and uh, but I'd been watching it now for probably about 15 minutes. It, it, it was stationary in the ground as if it was coming out of a, a hole in the ground about the size of a 45 gallon drum and it just went straight up and it looked just like this picture but it went to 4,000 feet and just as I got there it, it just finished as I got there and uh, there was nothing left but in the air but dust but, uh, it was uh, very cool to see uh, not sure if you could successfully fly them in them get any lift off them never heard of anybody doing it and they're probably only going to sandblast your plane anyway Thermal streets, calm conditions over regular terrain, thermals are more or less regularly distributed two and a half times as far apart as they are high. Any wind will tend to arrange them in rows. I think it tends to be about, uh, I have heard that it's uh, 10 to 15 knot winds will tend to produce stri uh, streets. So, and streets are lines of thermals that go in a straight line. They, they um, if you're flying along and they're going your direction, you'd be a fool not to use them. Uh, sometimes you can go along uh, great distances on streets without having to uh, turn. Uh, I think earlier this year I had, again, one of my most amazing flights. Um, I flew from Brantford to uh, um, the other side of Alliston at the ski hills there and back a couple of times. And uh, I'd flown for over an hour and over 100 kilometers and I'd never circled just flying along back and forth along this. Uh, it was kind of a strong street, um, and I'm not sure there, at the end what scared me away was that there was a, uh, appeared to be a thunderstorm at the end of it, so I turned around and went home. Otherwise, I'd probably still be in it. But uh, again, it was fun. Um, just watch out for what's above that you cannot see. Um, also, in, in thermal streets, there's sink streets. so. Uh, what's going up in the middle of a street um, can go down just in equally in a straight line uh, is a sink street. If you get in, in a street of air that's going down and maybe you can't see it, uh, there's no cloud, you just happen to be in air that's going in a sink and you're not in, you're flying for you know, 10, 20 seconds and it's still sink, 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 you're probably in a sink street. So, and if you're flying into wind, turn 90 degrees and fly out of it. Um, thermal height um, prediction, plotting thermal height. Um, sorry, the uh, clip is out of uh, out of uh, proportion, but uh, I mentioned before the uh, environmental lapse rate. That would be the blue line here, the environmental lapse rate. Uh, if you kn know the expected high for the day, um, you can plot a line on a, this is a, a tepograph, so it has the, the um, uh, dry adiabatic lapse rate here, 
which is that five degrees per thousand feet. Uh, so if you were to know the high of the day and you plot, if it was only going to be 28, you plot a line on here that matches the, DA, the dry adiabatic lapse rate on the same angle as that. And where it intersects uh, the blue line, your, your environmental lapse rate, that would be the uh, height where, where uh, the, the lift would, you know, the top of the thermal uh, should happen. Uh, and how the day will progress. Um, in the top left chart, notice the temperature increasing with altitude. Um, on for the first thousand feet. Uh, this is the morning radiation inversion. So in the morning, um, the ground is giving off heat and it creates an inversion so it, it, the, the temperature uh, is is warmer above than uh, than than it is on the ground. So uh, it's also called a nocturnal inversion uh, until the ground temperature is high enough. A trigger temperature is reached. That's the the, the temperature the ground has to get in order to get through the, the nocturnal inversion um, to allow the the dry adiabatic lapse rate to break through that in inversion thermals won't happen. Uh, upper right screen shows this. Um, trigger temper temperature is reached. The lower right uh, screen shows the temperature has reached 29 degrees. So, and the daily adiabatic lapse rate will reach the dew point and thus clouds should start to form and this will be cloud base. So, um, and that is at about 5,500 feet. And um, the bottom right screen shows the saturated adiabatic lapse rate from the dew point level. And that's uh, 1.6 uh, degrees. And from the dew point level, intersecting the uh, environmental lapse rate, and at that level, the clouds will top out. So you see the little depiction on the on the uh, screen where the top of the clouds are is where the saturated adiabatic lapse rate crosses the blue. Metars. Well, um, I have another uh, another uh, video that explains the METARs. These uh, sites here that you go back to, they will be the explanation of the of the METARs. There's about five to six pages of abbreviations for the METARs. So, in order for us to go through and try and look at five to six abbreviation pages of abbreviation, is just uh, it's too time consuming to do here, uh, but if we, it will just start the uh, next one and you'll just get a quick run through and I'll, I'll stop it if he's, if he's giving too much commentary that's not self-explanatory on, uh, on the, on the video. Just as a little side note, um, yeah. the, the while the codes are still active and being used, uh, most weather sites, including uh, flight planning from Nav Canada, um, you have the option of choosing the standard coded message or a plain language message where it actually does the translations for you. Um, yeah. So this this whole you know being able to interpret the coding is becoming less and less of an issue. Um, but you do need to know it for the exam. That's the, the kind of the tricky part. Yeah, yeah. In actual fact, have we, you know, 
Uh, do we use it? No. Uh, you know, airline uh, pilots get to use it because they're sending uh, data over over links, and they want to keep you know messages small, so they 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 uh, you know this will get the most amount of information down in the least amount of space. Yeah. And uh, and and when you're reading them every day, all day, like an airline pilot would be, it it yeah. becomes its own language, and and you just yeah. you get to know it, and it becomes a very fast, efficient way of not only translating the information, but but you know quickly, quickly reading it. Um, so we'll put it we'll, in your short-term memory. <laughs> yeah, totally. Eh? Um, so yeah, this would be definitely, exam, yeah. definitely something to study for the exam. Um, but one one source you can do is is you can go look at the METAR uh, from Nav Canada, and, and uh, when you do the plain language one, it actually has the embedded coding in the the table. So it'll, it'll have the table, the plain language, and then right at the top, it has the little bar of um, coded language, and you can kind of you know start to interpret the two. But we'll definitely do a session on the field one day and, and walk everyone through that. Mm -hmm. And so sources that you can get this information uh, from um, NAV Canada, Flight and Weather. Uh, you can get your weather from the Weather Channel on TV, um, Environment Canada. You know, they, they uh, put out the METARs and the TAPs. And just, Carrie, okay. for those who don't know, what does METAR as an acronym and TAF as an acronym stand for? Uh, TAF is a terminal air cast, uh, uh, term, terminal airport forecast. Yep, I believe. Yeah, ter terminal area yeah. forecast. Yeah, area forecast, and the METAR is metro uh, meteorological. Uh, boy, it's been a while since I said it. <laughs> Okay, what is it, Dave? <laughs> so it's it's the meteorological area report. So really, Arts. it's R and the S yes. that you have to worry about. Yeah. One's a report. Yeah. Here's the current conditions. The other is the forecast. Yeah. Here's the future conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so weather briefings from the flight service stations, you know, still available. Um, used to be uh, something that everybody relied on before they went to fly because that was your weather office. That was, you know, but now with the, with the advent of the of the internet, you know, people are, are getting very familiar with, with just reading their own weather and uh, getting what they need off the internet. Um, some website links um, to be, um, I've got both of these sites, but there's four, so NOAA is, uh, is, is a good source of weather. Um, I'm not sure what teenagers level was. I can't remember what they put in there. No. Uh, click it and find out. You might be surprised. And the first link on the here is the transport list of topics that you need to know for the exam. You know, take a look at it. Make sure you've covered all the topics. Uh, the second link down below is the weather command manual. Uh, you can download that PDF form at that link. Uh, it's probably 368 pages. It's known as the Bible on the weather. So anything and everything uh, from pressure to clouds to whatever is uh, it's the recommended study guide for by Transport Canada so it's probably where their list of questions have, have come from and it's the book that meteorologists use a lot of them for for, uh, for, for the course on weather courses and so you know it's it's, it's the, the, the Bible as I say uh, but it's free. It's it's uh, copyright as as, uh, as there were some questions on whether it was legal to download it, but copyrights expired on it, and uh, they've been granted permission to publish it there. So, and that's about it. So, um, and and we'll include all those links on the um, yeah. on the quiz. So, Carrie, I know you sent me the quiz already. If you can just pop those yeah. links into it and resend. And I'm just okay. going to unmute everyone. Bing, bing, bing. Here we go. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts, just as we wrap up this evening? I, I, have, I have probably a thousand questions about meteorology, <laughs> but I'm afraid we're way over the, the, the time now. I, I'll only select one, which I, I really 
believe it's important for, for, for good flying and for life saving. How do you distinguish uh, cumulonimbus and uh, in, in just a regular congestus clouds? So I know from a distance it's quite easy to distinguish like uh, a cumulonimbus is pretty tall, it goes very, very high. Uh, then just a, a, a huge cumulus or congestus of cumulus, which is congestus. Uh, so the second one will provide you a great lift and it will provide you a great flying. The first one may kill you, <laughs> it depends on it works. So I know from a distance it's easy, but uh, when, you, when you happen to fly under one, and is there any way to distinguish under what you're flying? Yeah. Because the, you throw a hammer out the window if it goes up, you're under a cumulus <laughs> Yeah, then run, okay. <laughs> but now, the, most of the time you're going to, you know, cumulus nimbus is going to develop slowly uh, and they develop often and, you know, you, you fly towards them. Uh, you see them from the side, you know, anytime you see something towering up and up and up and up like the Empire State Building sort of thing, you, you know it, that that's the, you know, the big one developing. Um, the the size occasionally, the, yeah. the size of the base would be a good indicator. So, like, if you get under something that looks like it's a few miles wide, as opposed to just a, you know, a few hundred feet wide, um, or a thousand feet wide. I mean, yeah. And yeah. the darkness. I mean, you know, sometimes you can get a stratiform cloud that's that's layered that 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 you know goes quite a distance, and you don't know, you know. You don't know that it's really, really thick, but if you get if you think it's stratiform, but it's black on the bottom, um, it might be, and you know, might be worthwhile trying to get out from under. You know, and and you if it's a cumulus nimbus, there, you know, there's an edge around. They aren't that big that you can't fly back out from under it and get a look at the side of it. You know, if you're in doubt, go out, get out from under it and go look at the side of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Yeah. Um, for for the rest of your questions, I think that was uh, Sweat Van talking. Just not one hundred percent sure. Um, if for the rest of your questions, you know what? Write them down in an email, fire them off, and what we'll do is I'll get Carrie to compose a response, and then uh, we'll send the response. We'll send the questions and the responses to uh, everyone so that they can all have a read. Does that sound good? Yep. Sounds good. All right. Yep. So we're going to call it a night. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie, for, for lending your expertise. I know there's there's a, a huge depth of information and knowledge there yet to still be tapped. Um, we'll definitely do some stuff on the field. And um, I can't stress this enough. I look at all the high experience, um, really good cross-country pilots that I want to emulate. And much like Carrie, they're they're kind of you know students of of meteorology, so uh, it's one of the things that I really see as a key separator between the you know kind of average pilots and the really good ones. So um, thanks everyone for your time this evening. Uh, we'll close it off for tonight, and we'll see you next week. Now that we've learned how to fly cross country and and learn the weather to predict and all that, we'll learn how to get lost as we look at navigation. <laughs> all right, we'll see you guys next week. Good night. 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 Good night.